Have your Bibles with you this morning, and if you don't have a Bible with you, there are Bibles in somewhere in the row of seats in front of you, underneath the seat there. You can find one, plus we'll also have, uh, I think most of the Scripture will be on the, on the screens this morning as well, too. But Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah lived during the time of King Uzziah. And it's, it's kind of interesting, if you, if you read the book in the Old Testament, the books of First and Second Kings, it's sort of like walking through a royal graveyard and l- looking at the names of the kings that had served there. Some had served for just a few months and some served for uh, a number of, of years. And, and, and the stories of the rulers read sort of like the, like the epitaphs on their, uh, on their headstones there until we come to King Uzziah. King Uzziah was unlike many of the other kings who served for only just a few years, and some even just for a few months. But, but Uzziah ruled over Israel for uh, 52 years. And... Uh, and so, you know, he was pretty established in his, in his reign. And one of the dangers that faced the people of Israel, because King Uzziah had, had ruled uh, for so many years, that they, they may have had a tendency to elevate King Uzziah over God, because he had just, Uzziah had been a constant in their life. For so many years, and uh, and if they did that, what they were doing was uh, uh, sort of dethroning God and making Uzziah more important than God was. And we don't know for sure, but this may have happened to Isaiah as well too, um, that he had his eyes more on King Uzziah than he had on God for. A period of time. And so, uh, here again, that may have been why uh, the Lord got Isaiah's attention one day by revealing himself to Isaiah. And we find this in Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And the train of his robes filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You know what happened to Isaiah that day? As the Lord revealed himself to him, Isaiah saw himself in contrast to the glory of God. He saw himself in contrast, and he realized his true condition. Verse 5, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King of the Lord of hosts. Now, what happened to Isaiah has happened to people, countless people, millions of people throughout the ages. God's holiness was a transforming truth in Isaiah's life, and it's a transforming truth in our life, too, when we recognize, when we acknowledge that God is holy. And God is worthy of our, of our thoughts and our attention. You go back and look in, in, in the Hebrew and the Greek words for holy. Both of these convey the idea of separateness. 
God is holy. And when Scripture says something is holy, it means it is set apart. It's dedicated. It's consecrated for the work and the, for the glory of God. Holiness be, means being separated from all the things that are sinful, that are impure, that are imperfect. And by the way, this is one of God's essential characteristics. He is completely free from contamination. Did you realize that? He is completely free. He is separated from all that is sinful, that is impure, and that is perfect. And although God offers us, when we come to the foot of the cross and and we realize Christ died on the cross for our sins as well as the sins of the world, when we come to the foot of the cross, we experience complete forgiveness. But we can never experience the holiness of a complete sinless existence in this life because we live yet with a fallen nature on this side of glory. That's why Isaiah responded like he did to God's glory. He, and, and maybe we can better understand his feelings, but I want you to imagine this. It's monsoon season around here. We get heavy rains. And if you're out in the desert, you're going to run into mud out there. So you're, you are completely caked with mud. All right, you got that picture in your eye, in your mind? Completely caked with mud. Your clothes are filthy. And then as you leave that scene, imagine in your mind, you're caked with mud, your clothes are filthy, and you walk into a scrubbed, gleaming, Stainless steel surgical suite. Those intense surgical lamps identify every piece of mud on you and in your clothes and on your clothes. I think that is what Isaiah kind of felt when God's glory shone upon Isaiah's dirty soul in his life. He realized how unclean he was in the light of God's glory. So why do we need to think about God's holiness? What's, what's important? There's two things. You see them on the screen. The first one is this, what it reveals about God. It's one reason we need to understand something about God's holiness. He is uh, completely trustworthy. God's holiness assures us of that trustworthy. He is morally unable to take advantage of us. He is morally unable to abuse us or listen to this or even manipulate us. Sometimes we may find ourselves in a spot and we're thinking, all right, God, what are, you, what are you trying to do to me now? You know what God's trying to do to you is love you and separate you from the things that creates the horrible, the difficult, the mean, the dirty stuff that's there. His holiness guarantees that He will honorably deal with us. And we will never have to wonder, we will never have to question whether His plans are going to backfire or His plans are going to work against us. And since He is holy, we need to remember this. God is our model of perfection. He is without flaw either hidden or exposed. You know what? Every one of us in this room has some sort of flaw. 
Right? We do. Sometimes, sometimes it gets exposed in people's life. John's crazy. And you know I'm crazy. It, it happens. But also, also there are oftentimes many flaws that are hidden with us. No one else knows. This week, this weekend at the retreat, we had a we had an illusionist there. Harris the third. Go to I went on YouTube last night to see what if there are any videos there, and there are a lot, a lot of videos of Harris. Just put Harris three in there. But he's a Christian illusionist that told stories as he performed the different tricks that he did. He was good. He even told us how he did some stuff, and I still never figured it out. But this is what he, what he tried to help us learn through our time together this weekend, that oftentimes there are things out there that deceive us. We think it's, it's, it's good on one hand. We think this is just the right thing to do. And things of this world deceive us. But God never does. He doesn't trick us. He is honest. He is trustworthy. Because God is holy. That's what it reveals about Him. Also, we need to understand God's holiness because of how it affects us. Now, what if God just reserved holiness only for Himself, withholding that from us? Turn with Him, you would, over into 1 John chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 5 and 6. If God just reserved holiness, holiness only for himself, then we would not be able to have fellowship with him. That's what 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 and 6 says. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Oftentimes the word light in Scripture is used as a symbol of, of purity. And God is absolutely pure, not with one dark thought, not with one stained motive, not with one shady statement or act. Sometimes we, we may picture God being up in heaven and says, all right, I'm, fix, I'm fixing to get Barry here. He doesn't know what he's got, but I'm fixing, I got a trap set for him. That's the devil. That's not God. God's separate from that. God is absolutely pure. It's impossible for light to coexist with darkness. It's impossible for holiness to coexist with sin. But through His grace... God gives us the opportunity to overcome the darkness of our souls and we can walk in the light of His holiness. Look at verse 7, 1 John chapter 1. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. You see, without holiness, not only would we be separated from God, but we'd live our entire lives in the stranglehold of sin, unable to free ourselves from the grip that it has. And ultimately, without holiness, we're never going to see our Lord. There's a paraphrase of Hebrews 12, 14. It goes like this. Pursue peace with all men and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. 
I'll give you a couple of examples from Scripture. There's an Old Testament one. How many just love to read through the book of Leviticus? You just can't wait to pick up your Bible in the morning and get a good chunk of Leviticus. But there's an important verse found in Leviticus 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 44. The first half of this verse says, For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. That ancient scripture, that ancient requirement is there to help us understand how to approach a holy God. Look over in Romans chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. And this verse spells out another requirement as well, too. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness." You see, without Christ, we are a taskmaster task to sin. And we can, we can make all the resolutions we want, but we cannot keep from serving sin unless we have the power that helps us overcome it. And you know where that power comes from? Power of the cross. The power is Christ. When we come to the cross, our slavery to sin is canceled, and we become enslaved to God. But here's the dilemma we face this side of, this side of heaven. Sin still dwells within us. But I want to tell you, the good news is, not as a landlord, but as a tenant. When we invite Christ to the master of our hearts and our lives, the title is transferred from the sin to the Savior. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, I want you to notice this carefully. If you have your scriptures, look at these. And um, see if you can identify where these are. I don't want you to think about five things here that Peter gives us in these scriptures about serving God and the holiness of Him. He gives us five active commands, beginning in verse 13. Therefore, matter of fact, you see the, the the heading in my Bible says, we're called to be holy. If we're called to be holy, therefore, preparing your minds for action, being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. I want you to know there's five things in those verses. I wrote real tiny in my Bible, one, two, three, four, five in these scriptures. Here's the first one. Prepare your minds for action, verse 13. Prepare your minds for action. If you're going to be holy, we got to make preparation. We make preparation through prayer uh, with God, through our fellowship with Him, by understanding and reading His Word and, and, and grasping what He requires, what He wants for us. we got to prepare our minds for action. Because as we get out in the world, we need to realize the second thing is we've got to be self-controlled. Set your, be, being sober-minded is what Peter is saying. Be, be self-controlled. 
Uh, the world's going to throw all kinds of things at us. If we're prepared for action, we're ready to deal with those. And we recognize those. We're discerning. We're sober-minded. Number three is found in verse uh, 13 as well, too. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Fix your hope. Listen. Listen. Fix your hope completely on the grace of Christ. Your hope is not found in how smart you are. Your hope is not found in what this world can offer. Your hope is found in Christ. And then number four is found in verse 14. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Those things that ruled our lives before we came to Christ... Peter helps us understand, don't be conformed to those kind of things. Put those behind you. And in number five, the fifth thing is, but verse 15, as he called you who is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. It's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now, here's a phrase that we hear people say a lot, and I want you to notice that this is not found in Scripture. Oftentimes, when we're going through difficult times, our friends try to counsel us, and they say to us, well, just let go and let God. We as believers have responsibility, if we're going to be holy, that our minds are ready. Uh, we are discerning what's going out there in front of us. We are, are grasping, well, those, or understanding that things we've had in our past are now be, beyond us. Our hope is in the grace of Christ. And everything that we try to do, we try to be holy doing that. There's action on our part. It's activity. The only letting go we're commanded to do is the letting go of the things of our past. So throughout Scripture, the Christian life is described as a battle. There's nothing passive about a soldier in battle. God empowers us as we go through the battles of life. And Paul even counseled young Timothy when he said to them, we must fight the fight. We must keep the faith in all that we're doing. So in light of what we have heard, if we want to stand unashamed in the light of God's holiness, there are three things for us to continually do in our lives. Keep ourselves from conforming to the former things of life, the former lust. We need, we need to remember to claim God's power as we look at those things, look out for those things in our lives. We've got to remind ourselves of our calling. We've been called to be holy. He has called us to share in that holiness, and we need to help other people understand who God is and how much He loves them. And then in verse 17, which I don't think we, we put on the screen this morning. Uh, that's not the right verse. Never mind. But this is the one thing we need to do. We need to conduct ourselves in fear. Now, a lot of people want to jump to that about fearing God. This doesn't mean fear as terror but fear and reverence. Fear, fear in all recognition of how holy God is and how He wants our lives to be holy as well, too, to be separate from the rest of the world. One of the biggest stumbling blocks to folks who are lost is sometimes they can't tell the difference between believers and non-believers. And as believers, 
We must live a life that reflects God's holiness and what He has done for us. And Christ dying on the cross, as He took His sins upon us, we must make Him Lord of all of our lives. Jesus is Lord of all because He is holy. He is separate from the things of this world. Will you pray with me this morning? Our holy God, as we reflect and think upon what we have heard through song, through the message, through Scripture, in our time of worship this morning. May each of us walk out of this room today recognizing and acknowledging and knowing that you are a holy God. You're not trying to trick us, but you want our lives to be complete and in line with your holiness. May, Father, you give us strength and courage and wisdom as we fight the battles of this life. And may our lives reflect that Jesus is Lord of all. And it's his name that I pray. Amen. If you're not a believer in Christ today, we've already prayed for you earlier in the service this morning. I pray that in our time together this morning, God, the Holy Spirit, speak into your life and, and you are uh, wanting, anxious to say yes to Christ today. We're going to sing a song and we invite you to come and, and share with us that, that action in your life that you're taking for the believer, all of us have struggles in life, don't we? Say, uh-huh. We do. But we have a holy God that loves us, and He loves us right where we are right now at this very moment. And He wants us to be holy, to make Jesus the Lord of everything. Maybe this morning... It's when we say, okay, I get it. Yes. We're going to stand together. John's going to lead us, and JP's going to lead us in a song of commitment. We invite you to come as we sing.